<laughs> Stay there, Renee. So <laughs> now, let me also introduce, please, our two guests for the panel, Mariam Clayson and Hans, Hans Rosling. Please, Mariam and Hans. <laughs> Now, you know Hans already, so I don't need to do a long introduction for him. And I know he's got lots to say in this panel. But let me introduce Mariam. Um, and both Mariam and Hans will have a few words to open up this panel. Mariam is the Deputy Director for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in Seattle. But Mariam has a wealth of experience. She is, of course, a Swede. Um, <laughs> She has been a fantastic and remains a fantastic global ambassador for Sweden in international institutions that don't just represent health, but represent that intersection between health and development. So we're very pleased to have Marion with us today. But Marion, why don't you kick off with a few okay. observations about what you've heard in this session? Thank you, Richard. I, I want to just add one thing to your introduction. The reason why Hans and I are together is that he can never resist the temptation of questioning whatever I say. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the only way to ensure some debate about something that I think many Swedes take for granted, which is equity and uh, equality. Uh, I think, fr in fact, that equity and equality has been sort of a hidden thread throughout today. I heard it in mm -hmm. your passionate mm -hmm. uh, talk, Richard, and brought out very explicit by you, Renee. And we were asked, and I'm sure that's something all of you are thinking about right now, is so what do we do with this information? How, how can we apply an equity lens and do things differently? And when we talk about what Sweden could be doing, I want to start with saying something that Sweden is doing and has been doing. Sweden has actually been a very reliable, almost predictable, consistent partner in global health. Sweden has invested in a thing like giving, you know, preventable, reducing preventable vaccine deaths by, we estimate maybe five and a half million children have had uh, deaths due to vac uh, vaccine preventable deaths reduced thanks to the support that Sweden has given to Gavi. Sweden is a partner in finding innovative solutions. How do we bring down costs of, of contraceptives so that it can be available um, uh, to those who need it the most? So Sweden is a partner, but that's why you are important today. We need your voice to make sure that that continues into not just up to 2015 and beyond. We need your voice because I think something we've learned from Sweden uh, when we talk about equity and in a, in a, in a, uh, and poverty is that it doesn't come with economic growth. We learn from Sweden that it's come with poor policies and civil society, Folkrörelser. If we look at some of the answers that have been thrown out today, just take child mortality because that's something we all know something about. And as Richard said, it's been reduced from more than 11 million when I started to work in this field to less than 7 million today. We also estimate that if we keep the pressure on, if we continue to do what we should be doing, we can bring that down to 2 million. So we can bring it down to two thirds by two thirds by, by 2030. Now, Rene talked about income inequalities. If you look at child mortality, it's not just what Richard said, which is that you know, in some societies where we work, it's been flat. There hasn't been a reduction in child mortality. It's even gone up during this period. But you can also look at, uh, scratch a little bit more behind the surface. Look at gender. A girl child in India dies at much higher frequency than a boy child. If you just brought down girl child, uh, child deaths, but the same as boys, you would say one to two million deaths, just by closing the gap between girls and boys. If you think about under fives, we have made great progress after 28 days of life. The first 28 days of life, we haven't made any movement. It's flat, frankly. Neonatal mortality hasn't changed much. And it's not as we used to think, at least I used to think some years ago, that it was too difficult. In fact, we have cost-effective solutions for bringing down neonatal deaths. So here are great opportunities. India has been mentioned today, and I heard someone to my right say that economic growth was the answer bet you know, in your choice between hip, you know, fixing the joints or providing uh, water to children. India is already growing economically. 
three facts about India. India has more malnutrition, not just in relative terms, but in absolute terms, than sub-Saharan Africa today. At the same time, it has more obesity. It's among the top six countries in terms of obese children. It has more billionaires than Sweden has. So uh, the answer <laughs> to the Indian problem is not growth, but through poor policies. The where do we make the gains? Do we have to make choices between hip joints and water, clean water for children? No, it's the wrong comparison. We can't make sure that a 50-year-old Swede gets his or her hip joint and a child in UP or Bihar of India gets clean water or the mother has something to wash their hands with. The trade-offs, is not that's not the trade-off. The trade-offs is between prevention and cure. Imagine how much we could save if we make the trade-offs, cost-effective trade-offs within health between what we waste because we are not investing in prevention and etc. So I think that the, the it's a flawed dichotomy. I also think that, again, if you look at uh, the waste factor. Do you know that poor people pay more for qu poor quality health than, than better off? Do you know that in India, 70% of the poor pay out of pocket for, for poor quality services? Actually, Vietnam was mentioned for a period. Vietnam had 80% 80, 80 of their poor paid out of pocket. So we have to just add a few more dimensions to this discussion. It doesn't mean that we need to make it more complex and sort of end up in the big sphere where we are left with inaction. We think, and the organization that I represent, that we can make very smart investments. We can very make very smart investments, for example, in the thousand day window. Thousand days for me is not the thousand days to 2015, it's the thousand day of, of early life. If we invest in the, you know, the pregnant mother and preferably before she gets pregnant, the, the young girl, the pregnant mother, the interpartum period, after birth and up to the first two, three years of life, you have an investment, not just in mortality reduction, but in healthy, productive contributor to society in the next generation. Very good. <laughs> Thanks, Marion. Hans, a few opening remarks before we get into a little discussion. There are seven billion people in the world one billion live at the economic level of Sweden, two billion are extremely poor, four billion are somewhere in between. <laughs> there are seven million children dying. How are they distributed over these seven billion people? Well, there is one, two, three, four, five, six million child death among the two billion poorest. Those four billion people have just one million child deaths. Here it's negligible. The question was never between a hip replacement of a Swede and survival of a child. It was that Vietnam cannot afford this for everyone once they've done the smart investment. India will never afford hip replacement for everyone if they don't have economic growth. And to get economic growth, they have to get people out of poverty and do the smart investments today and be helped with that. Because it's, that's why it's so possible, because it has already been done here. The first country to get aid from Sweden in maternal and child health was Tunisia 50 years ago. At that time, Sweden had 2% child mortality and Tunisia had 20%. At the eve of the Arab Spring, Tunisia had 1.9% child mortality, lower than Sweden had when Sweden started to give aid. That shows the transformative effect of the modernization of famine. And I completely agree that this can be achieved in 20 years with good investments in countries. The big inequity problem is here in between, and perhaps South Africa is the worst problem of them all. But there are so many other countries. Inequity is terrible here in these four billion. In some of the poorest countries, inequity is not so much a problem because everyone almost is so very poor. And you cannot be poorer because then you die. So we need to get these people out of it. And I 
think that is ending extreme poverty. To me, that is separate from reducing the terrible inequalities among the main part of the world population here in the middle. You can terminologically, you can handle it as that. But then we end up in the discussion we had in Sweden about child poverty, barnfattigdom. And many people in the public say, well, there are, in there are poverty here also. There are inequity here also. There are inequity, not to mention southern Glasgow uh, in the UK, where we have the inequity problem. This is something different to me, because if you get one billion out here, it replicates itself, because population is doubling here in 20 years. That's why it's so wise to go here. And as Mariam rightly said, this one is neonatal deaths almost entirely. And half of this die in the first month, where you now are offering new promising treatment, proven by research, remain to be proven in practice also. And that will be <laughs> done. That will be done. So we see it, see it happening. And this can be done in 20 years, and it's a thing of itself. And almost nothing of this has anything to do with climate change. Okay, Hans, the worst environmental problem here yeah. is that one billion drink their neighbor's lukewarm feces, and one billion have indoor air pollution. In 20 years' time, climate change may be a major impact on health in the world, and in 40, it may be just terrible. But mm. as of today, it's other problems that dominate completely. So can I just, let me just um, clarify. <laughs> let me just try and clarify what, you, what you're saying. Um, so what Rene was talking about was the importance of minimizing gaps. Closing gaps. Yeah, closing gaps. I'm pitching it too weakly, closing gaps as a priority in global health policy. You're talking about poverty eradication. Extreme poverty. Extreme poverty eradication. So can I just set up a little dialogue, um, and then I'll bring Mariam in, but set up a little dialogue between you and Rene on this. Your view about closing gaps as the overriding priority, Hans? No. It is the first priority which can be done relatively rapidly, is getting the last two billion into some sort of situation, a situation of poverty, from extreme poverty to poverty. But it, uh, aren't we talking about the same thing? I mean, that, that is beginning to I close the gap, I can tell you a it? measure. Two-child family, on average. As long as you replicate, as long as Congo and Afghanistan double in one generation, as long as the families get children to have girls to go and fetch water and firewood. That's why water is but so important. But aren't you just describing the same thing? No. You're just describing it in a different way. <laughs> Rene is saying, close the gap. And you're saying, yes, close the gap by beginning with eradicating extreme yeah. poverty. Yeah. Isn't that Please. the same? No, I say begin eradicating yeah, extreme yeah. poverty okay. and then right, also so close stop, the stop. gap. Where would you start? Erad <laughs> We're going to get there. Mm. Uh, where, is that right, Rene? Do we begin with eradication of extreme poverty to achieve your objective of closing the gap? Well, I, I have no difficulty with eradicating extreme poverty. And of course, as you know, I have an ambition of closing the gap. What, I'm, what I have an issue with is that we have had, over the last 15 years, an agenda of eradication of extreme poverty. And from the evidence that we have, including evidence from the World Bank, by the yeah. way, that unless our countries and our economies eradicate and, uh, poverty and grow by closing inequalities, mm -hmm. we will not have sufficient resources to eradicate poverty, right. nor to grow in the way that Miriam was talking yeah, about. Yeah. So what I'm saying is it's not an either or, it's something we have to do coherently, that we have to close the gap, we have to eradicate poverty, and that Dealing with inequality allows us to eradicate poverty and address the gaps. Yeah. So and grow, by the yeah. way. And just, and can I say, yeah. just before Mariam comes yeah. in, just to say you were at the bank mm -hmm. for exactly. some years, yes. so you've experienced yeah. this, this discussion yeah. from a very political mm -hmm. development perspective. Right, Mariam. and I think the most important thing the World Bank has done was the 1993 economic analysis investing in health, which showed that if you invested in the health <laughs> of these down here, you, 
we would in fact address both inequality and address <laughs> poverty reduction because what does it mean to eradicate extreme poverty? There are a few things we can do. One thing is invest in health, so you have more healthy, productive people. One thing which is so exciting when we are so worried about de demographic change is this so-called de demographic dividend. There are some poor countries by reducing child mortality and at the same time bring down fertility through family planning, that combination frees up young, productive people. It brings women out to the workforce and we have now example of this demographic dividend, a bonus that countries can give. It's a short window, but it doesn't happen without policies. I think what you're talking about, eradication of extreme poverty, has to do with pro-poor pro policies, creating jobs, stimulus, the right kind of investments in, in health of that generation, and I do agree with you for mm -hmm. once, Richard, <laughs> <laughs> that, that we are actually talking about the same thing, yeah. closing the gap, it's the house, the means and the house, because I, I actually feel a little bit in the middle here, actually. <laughs> So may, maybe, we, oh, that's good. you can come closer, that's fine. <laughs> um, I won't bite. So, I, th I mean, maybe we have got some agreement here, but I put a challenge to both of you now, because what we are seeing in the world today is actually an undermining of multilateralism, mm -hmm. an attack on solidarity, mm -hmm. what the fi global financial crisis and the policies of austerity that many governments have introduced has created is actually a deepening mm -hmm. of inequity and yeah. inequality, not close, not even minimi beginning to minimize the gap, let alone closing the gap. Mm -hmm. So we're, we seem to be going in the wrong direction from where both of you are focusing on. And Nisha, and you're going to come in right now. Can I just throw something in yeah. from Ingrid Eckerman, who's tweeted us, does economic growth actually eradicate extreme poverty? I'm really sorry about this, but I, yeah. it's an important issue. Sure. Or does it actually increase the gaps? Right, mm -hmm. right, okay. Can so. The Key policies question. we're pursuing at the moment are the wrong policies, right, mm -hmm. Hans? What is happening now <laughs> is that... <laughs> Don't you love him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not so complicated. What's happening now is that these people remain in the same situation. These ones move upwards here, and they get richer, and there is, there is one, sort of, one sort of little extra filthy rich people who are up here. <laughs> <laughs> Can I touch these this? Yeah. These people will never be solved by economic you growth. This here. will never be solved by market forces. Them. This is policy and public investments. Which okay, is let, let Marion If, play you, if you look at one country that has had economic growth, United States, it's actually tripled its GNP since 1960. What's happened there? Yes. Yeah. Mm. This uh, 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 Sorry. Uh, no one is there at all in the United States of America, but the filthy okay. rich are there. <laughs> right. right. True. Right. So can right. you move some people up there too? So isn't the point? So isn't? Can I Go can ahead. I comment? So isn't the message here? How dare I? That we have political choices. We have political choices, and we're making the wrong political choices at mm. the moment. So we've only got a few minutes left. So what I'd like to do is to be very concrete because one of my disappointments in watching the whole discussion around inequalities and social determinants over recent years is we've had dozens of commissions. We're brilliant at describing the problem. But as you said, Rennie, we have not been good at translating all of those descriptions and commissions into effective political action. Now, what are the one or two things you think we could do to address this? Rennie, I'll start with you. Well, I raised some of them in what I presented, is that I, I think we have to go beyond looking at individuals and look at the public policies and the relationship between business and its obligations to public goods. Okay. We have to be very clear about what public goods are global obligations. So holding the private sector more accountable. And not just by political means, but by legal means, by okay. changing the okay. law okay. to ensure that, that they are required to be accountable for yep. community and yep. for environmental interests, yep. that they are required to do public health impact assessments and environmental health impact assessments, that they're required to give public information yep. before they come in and in. All the things that get back public regulation into these spheres of activity. Secondly, I think we have to reclaim the state. I think we've started to think about health as a commodity that can be delivered through the market. 
I think that's very worrying if we are talking about equity, mm -hmm. that health has to be an area of regulation in the interests of public good, and we have to re-strengthen the regulatory framework in public health. And that's where I'm very keen that we look at the interface between environmental laws, incentives and measures, and public health laws, incentives and measures, because public health has fallen away actually in this whole phrase even though climate okay. might not be and my final point sorry oh, okay. is that is that I, I i think we have to realize that we are building inequality within communities at a much higher rate than we are building it across countries and uh, we're getting a, a global class of wealth and a global class of poverty that is actually transnational we cannot have goals that are country by country we have got to have global social responsibility articulated within any post-millennium framework. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, René. <laughs> One or two, as you can see the clock briefly, concrete recommendations to minimize, it, close the gaps in terms of inequality. Education, health and infrastructure and support to some minimal productivity in agriculture, because this is a rural issue that can be done. The rich people tend to have difficulties to understand here. Syria is somewhere here in the middle. That was the country that reduced maternal mortality most the last 20 years, mm -hmm. but the dictatorship was unbearable by the people, so they made an uprising. Mm -hmm. Democracy is much uh, needed here. Even democracy doesn't solve it well over here. So, keep it here. There's a danger, for instance, that our government, when we now are reallocated aid money to the Syrian refugees, we will cut down on vaccination in the poorest. Keep a watching eye on that, what our government is going to do. No. Oh, easy. I agree with Hans. Do what Hans said but do it with the equity lens to ensure that we have indeed poor, poor policies. When I started working in international health, I thought it was just a matter of working with the diseases of poverty and the conditions of poverty, but it's also about how we do it, the incentives we put in place. It's about reaching the hard to reach. I think we have reached the low hanging fruits. It's not going to be easier, it's going to be more difficult, but we have to really do a very targeted approach. Thank you. thank you to Hans, thank you to Mariam, and especially thank you to Renan. Thanks, Hans. I'm sorry well for touching you. Well done. Well done. Well done.